It has been a thousand years, Zareth, since the seventh dragon banished our kind from the face of Asha. We have waited for you. Dark Messiah, Might and Magic. Dark Messiah of Might and Magic is a first-person RPG game released in 2006 by Arcane Studios for the Xbox 360 and, pro gamers. and the PC. This isn't working. Despite the powerhouse of Arcane Studios behind it, the game was met with mixed reception upon release. So why review this 17-year-old game now? Oh well, lord knows I have the time, and when it first came out I played it to death almost two decades ago. I remember reading the review for Dark Messiah in a copy of PC Zone magazine. That was the magazine you used to get in the UK if you wanted to read instead of look at the pictures. It sounded great, a visceral first-person swordplay game with magic and environmental damage. I played the demo that came on the DVD until the reader burnt a hole through it. I loved the game. So why the mixed reception, I wondered. Well, where a lot of UK publications seemed to love the game, a lot of US journalists didn't. So divisive was the game that the UK PC Gamer gave it a score of 88, whereas the American counterpart gave it 49. Dark Messiah is a violent game, and the Americans are a violent people, why don't they like it? Well, it has to do with a key difference between our two cultures. The Americans never quite learn to appreciate the art of kicking the ever-loving shit out of someone quite like we do over here. But in all seriousness, there may have been some expectations reviewers placed on the game, based on the fact that it is a might and magic game. Dark Messiah eschewed the heavy RPG elements that were hallmarks of the might and magic series for a simpler talent tree system. And people that may have been hoping to talk every fucker's ear off with a rich and branching dialogue system would be disappointed. Dark Messiah was light on the RPG and heavy on the action. Add to that, earlier in 2006, Oblivion had come out and wowed everyone with how amazing it was. It's hard to have your little Source Engine adventure in the wake of Todd Howard's Tartarian Gate. My own thoughts about Oblivion aside, I preferred Skyrim. Even with all its RPG bells and whistles, the swordplay was absolutely lacklustre, so imagine my surprise when later that year comes a game with a robust swordplay system. And after playing it, I didn't give a shit about a dialogue or heavy RPG system. There were already plenty of games that did that very well. It used the proven Source engine, which had absolutely knocked the world's socks off with Half-Life 2 in 2004, which automatically gave it a physics engine light years ahead of most other games at the time. And Arcane went wild with it. Fully realised swordplay, environmental combat, a powerful magic system, and a true sense of immersion. Everything about this game reeks of adventure, and I love it. I'm just going to launch straight into the combat, and really if you're playing this game for anything else, you're in the wrong place. You don't pick a character class, but you can develop any mixture of warrior, wizard and rogue archetypes over the course of the game, via the talent tree system. Each talent costs a different amount of points, and you can obtain a total of 88 points. Despite complete freedom to choose your path, the game encourages you to specialise. Harshly. Weapons you lack the strength for will not be equippable. Likewise, those more potent spells you unlock will drain your mana pool fast if you choose to gain a proficiency in bows instead of boosting your mana. Swords in Dark Messiah are far more than weapons. They're basically the difference between life and death. This weapon is your life. You can build several types of playstyle throughout the game, but without a sword you're going to have it very rough indeed. Fortunately, they're also one of the most satisfying parts of the game. You can attack and parry with just a sword, but if you have a shield equipped you'll block instead. Blocking with a shield is generally better than parrying, because it's bigger and allows you to prime attacks from behind your shield. But it reduces your visibility, and they have limited durability. Especially against orcs, who can break through shields like the fucking Borg. You can keep spamming quick attacks for a constant barrage of fencing-like manoeuvres. These swift attacks can keep your opponent occupied while you dance to a better position but eventually they'll grow tired and break through with a power attack. And there lies the real bread and butter of your moves, your own power attacks. Power attacks can help break opponents' blocks, stagger enemies, and it just inflicts a big amount of damage. Your current direction determines the type of power attack you perform. In true risk-reward fashion, power attacks leave you vulnerable. If you decide to thrust, you're going to create an opening for someone to nick an artery, especially if you just straight up miss. There are also staves, which deal less damage, but you can twirl them around like a badass and live out your monk dreams, 
substituting meditation for wanton violence. Staves can also contain magical properties like shielding you, unleashing charged spells or setting people on fire. Daggers are mini swords and about as useful as that concept sounds. I'm sure they're good for stealth gameplay but I didn't bother with them. My bias to sword play aside, the game features a fully fleshed stealth system with light based visibility and sound detection. Maybe not on par with Thief but it's there. Ah, uh, maybe it's just me, but you play a Thief or Hitman game like you're not supposed to be there. You play Dark Messiah like everyone else isn't supposed to be there. Melee combat in Dark Messiah is unbelievably simple to pick up, but takes time and thought to master. After booting up this game for the first time in a decade, I set it to hard and thought, yeah, I beat this 10 years ago, how hard can it be? Nah, mate, it takes a while to get back on that bike. But once I got back into the groove, mastering the thrusts and keeping mobile, I found my love for it returning. Don't get impatient with the sword after trying the tutorial, stick with it. You can wade into a group of enemies and just slash, but you can also have a sword fight on a staircase while enemies slowly encroach and push you higher, outnumbering you. But you're just biding your time, luring them all onto a stair so you can kick them down like dominoes. You also have an adrenaline meter that charges as you engage in combat. When it fills, it supercharges the next attack or spell you make. Different power attacks cause different adrenaline moves. There's nothing like a good impaling. What I love about this is even kicking someone off of your own blade creates a moving heavy body capable of colliding with other enemies. Man, they thought of everything in this game. You can disarm enemies and they'll go to recover their weapon. You can engage in blade clashes with them. Orcs will even pick you up and throw you away. The swordplay is truly exceptional. And while it's aged a bit and is clanky in places, I've yet to play a game that matches its swordplay. Besides Arcane's other brilliant child, Dishonored. I was installing a fire alarm system, but I was actually given the wrong type of alarm. Which is why it pains me to say that magic falls short. I absolutely adore magic in RPGs, so saying this hurts me more than it hurts these orcs. And I mean that literally, because magic can feel very weak. Some destructive spells feel underwhelming, the little flame bolts make me feel inadequate when I fire them, and they don't pack any sort of punch. Likewise, the powerful Inferno spell drains all my mana and skill points, and usually sets one dude on fire if I'm lucky. But spells like Fireball and Lightning Bolt are solid. They visibly charge up in your hands, you get the sense of the power growing at your fingertips until it's ready to be hurled towards your enemies, maybe creating an explosion that sends them flying. Lightning staggers enemies, giving you time to distance yourself, or move in and make small talk. The adrenaline version releases a chain bolt of lightning that bounces off walls. Yeah, I, I like lightning a lot. There are also utility spells like telekinesis, which lets you pick up distant items that may be inaccessible, or hurl the bodies of the fallen at their comrades like grim confetti at a funeral. But none of these compare to the power, the maliciousness, and the usefulness of the second tier freeze spell and its ability to create a small patch of ice on the floor. And this is what makes Combat in Dark Messiah so great. There's no sword move combos, no real spell interaction, no implied synergy between anything. And yet there is synergy in everything. The gameplay is quite simply a murder sandbox. You're given a selection of abstract tools and it's up to you to synergize them. For example, just tripping an enemy over on its own does no damage, but it leaves them open to being impaled through the chest. Throwing a box at someone will probably give them pause, but throw a burning box at them? And now we're talking. The game encourages you to play aggressively, to move and think on the run. It's the fantasy equivalent of a high octane shootout. You can sit still and fight enemies wave after wave, but the fun is in figuring out how not to fight them, how to dispatch them in the most entertaining way possible. Thinking on your feet and deciding how to use the environment to your advantage is essential. On environmental damage, the game got a lot of flack for its conspicuously placed spikes everywhere. 
but I think it's ill-deserved. The level design's really phenomenal for the time, and if you removed all the spike racks in the game, you'd still have a lot of fun knocking people off cliffs, breaking floors underneath them, throwing barrels at people. Honestly, just the thought of banging someone on the head with a fucking barrel should be enough to sell you on this game. The kick button is the most hilarious weapon in your arsenal. You play someone who hasn't skipped leg day in their entire life, so when you kick a man wearing an entire suit of armour, he is reduced to the weight of a football. This place is huge. More territory to conquer, that's all. Kick helps you reposition enemies, temporarily remove them from combat to give you some breathing room, and send them into obvious dangers. It can also be used to kick other objects into people, creating more chaos. You can't spam it either because you'll drain your stamina pretty quickly. Another part of gameplay is exploration. There are secret treasures hidden away and they're not always chests with a healing potion. Sometimes they hold powerful weapons. Platforming is present as well, aided by the rope bow, allowing you to create climbable ropes to reach high platforms. I think my biggest gripe with gameplay is there's too much of what other people were demanding more of back in 2006. They said the RPG side was too simplistic and dumbed down. It was compared to a simpler form of Deus Ex's skills, which I sort of understand but disagree with. Despite how you built your character in Deus Ex, you could always make it through the level, and always take a stab at using a weapon, even if you wouldn't be very good with it. If you put all your points into pistols, but then decide you want to use a rocket launcher, you can do it. Probably wouldn't fucking hit anything, but you could do it. The game didn't penalise you for wanting to have fun. In Dark Messiah, if you don't have strength free, you can't wield that sword you just waited three chapters to forge. Talk about an anti-climax. Dark Messiah needed to shed the RPG bondage holding it back. This is a game that should have just let you unlock all of the tools and wield all of the weapons to have as much fun as possible. And you can't say it's for balance reasons when you can wipe out 90% of enemies by making a wet patch on the floor. The limited points system holds the game back. It creates an environment where it wants you to make sword and sorcery work together, and then penalises you for trying to do so. Despite all this though, it still features some of the best melee combat in any game I've played. A selection of spells that isn't bloated. Great AI. A reasonable variety of enemies, although more would have been nice. And it just never leaves me with anything but a grin when the dust settles. Right, enough about kicking some poor sod into a fireplace. We're done chatting gameplay, although I will definitely refer back to it, like you might check a recipe before adding ingredients. But for the most part, we're ready for the oven. I look now to the story and characters. And this is where I agree with the critics. The story of Dark Messiah is... Well, it's not that it isn't memorable, it's that you can suss it all out in the first five minutes. I'm not going to blow by blow the story, but I'm not going to hold back when it's relevant. You are Saraf, and in true fantasy cliché, the story starts with your uncle Fenrig setting you menial work in the tutorial catacombs, looking for the Shantiri crystal. In fact, that's all you are to him, a tool to accomplish something. Saraf do this, Saraf do that. All you do uncle is tell me what to do, when am I going to become a great wizard or a- What is your bidding, my master? Okay, okay, I'll do as you ask. This is a far more interesting character called Zana, and I'm going to tell you right now, Zana is my favourite character in the game, but not for the reasons you might think. Zana is a guardian who has been bound to your soul for plot purposes. Zana is your headcanon demon, motivating and supporting you throughout the game, a constant whisper in your ear, and honestly one of the best parts of the game. She grows on you real fast, has a good sense of humour, and provides help if you get stuck. So Uncle Fenner sends you to Stonehelm to take the magic rock to Menelag. While in Stonehelm you meet the niece of Menelag, Lyanna, who acts like a bastion of goodliness. Lyanna is the other main female character. I think you can see where this is going. Five minutes after you get there, necromancers attack and kill Menelag, before making off with the Shantiri crystal. Five minutes after that you manage to steal it back from the head of the necromancer street gang. You then get Liana safely out of the city, and because of this, she is instantly wet for you. You saved me. I feel nauseous. Wake me when it's over. And she rides that the entirety of the game by getting you to do what she wants. It's around this point it's revealed that sweet Uncle Fenrig and Zana are actually evil. We got you. But it's okay because so are you. You're the offspring of a demon dad who has been in prison for doing crimes. 
He wants you to smuggle some hard drugs in using your limited RPG inventory space. After that, he wants you to free him as well, so he can wreak havoc upon the world. Of course! After that, the story is basic, so enough about that. I want to talk more about the dynamic between Zana and Saraf. Uh, I guess Liana too, but first I'm skipping to chat about Arantir. Arantir is the main antagonist of the game. He launches the assault on Stonehelm. He is the necromancer you steal the Shantiri crystal back from, the man who chases you across the sea, and ultimately the final boss of the game. Yet you don't really see much of him despite all this, which I like. It's easy to see too much of an adversary in games, and I choose my words carefully, for though he is an antagonist, he's not a villain. Arantir is actually the untold hero of this story. Despite being ruthless with no regard for the lives he takes, he is trying to stop you from ever reaching your full power and releasing your hell daddy from his prison. There's a cold, methodical motion to him. And it's a bit cliche for a necromancer, but this game is basically a fantasy cliche. It knows to play to its strengths. And he sounds smooth as fucking silk too. This mage never dines alone. Well, well, look who's here. You're never really explained Arantir's motivations until the very end of the game, where he monologues while you fight him. A monologue easily drowned out by the roars of a skeletal dragon. Besides that, you just have to work it out as it goes. It's hardly a thinker to work out, but I would have liked a bit more exploration into his character. There needed to be a dialogue between you and him, some back and forth at least, even if it left you both at an impasse. Sometimes dialogue can exist to serve no other purpose but to demonstrate that two parties will never reconcile their differences. But Saraf just stands there silently, not a word in edgeways, which, given that Arantir is quite talkative, is a wasted opportunity. Again, the game needed more story, more dialogue for its key characters. It's a definite weakness, and although I'm happy they kept Arantir's appearances infrequent, they also kept them far too short. I said I'd mention some more gameplay, so here we go. At one point, Arantir just fucking kills you, like any real adversary worth his salt would do. But because she is the only person you can count on in this universe, Zana resurrects you, and in doing so, bequeaths some of her power to you. You now have a demon form in which you can move faster and attack with your bare hands. Oh, and power attacks use your tail. You are surprisingly vulnerable in this form, and you take constant health damage while it's activated, but your attacks are very strong, and you regenerate health on kills to compensate. It's a welcome addition, but takes a lot more time to get to grips with than any other part of combat, and by the time it's in the game, most players probably won't bother with it. So, to the two ladies. The game is designed with clear endings. You either finish the game with Zana or Liana. Since Liana spends most of the game without ever knowing Zana exists, it's mostly fun listening to Zana belittle her. Liana is a functional character. I felt for her when her uncle Menelag dies, even though I've barely met the man, although he's clearly evil, so I shouldn't have. She's optimistic, and I mean, good. She's a good character, in the sense that's where she falls on the D&D alignment chart. She's a driving force for the story, just telling you what to do and where to go when she's present. Something Zana makes sure you notice. Liana seems like a sincere and earnest character, but because of the limitations of the game, you never really get to have a dialogue with her. Honestly, I'm struggling to come up with anything to say about Liana. I had more to say about Arantir. She's just a flat character. Aside from the fact that this innocent mage is in fact clearly evil. I'll explain later. Zana, on the other hand, is a constant companion. She's with you from the start of chapter one, and honestly, when I played Dark Messiah back in the day, I didn't truly appreciate just how much fun it is to have a character in your brain, both thematically and from a gameplay perspective. You never have to keep an eye on Zana. She's never going to turn up dead or return to the Sleeping Dragon Inn. She can say whatever she wants without consequences because only you can hear her. She's got her own plans and wants, but stuck in there, she's going to have to manipulate or convince you to see them come to fruition. She's a demonic fantasy Harvey. I love it. Finish him! Then we can go to that little Italian joint I know. Best of all, you can tell they had fun with it. There are times that Saraf gets into the banter and flirting with Zana. Your pretty little friend can come on board without becoming a pretty little pincushion. I'll just lower the pretty little gangplank then. Sarath. Honestly, would have liked more back and forth, but I'll settle for Zana's commentary. I've already praised Jeffrey Bateman for his work as Arantir, and despite my feelings about the character, Barbara Scaff embodies what they were going for in Liana. 
But Moon Daly steals the show as Zana. She perfectly captures the playful lethality of a succubus. She's direct, uninhibited and encouraging, but also manipulative and suggestive, secretive and jealous. She brings a mischievous tone to a game that otherwise takes itself quite seriously, narrative-wise, if not gameplay-wise. There comes a point where Liana is made aware of Zana in your brain space and feels totally betrayed. Unlike Zana, who'd rather keep you to herself but allows you to eye up other girls, Liana will straight up want to cleanse Zana from your contacts list. Now, when I played this all those years ago, I sort of read into this that Zana would be cleansed of her demonic nature. Not a smiting out of existence, but transformed into a lighter or at least more neutral being. Maybe a really horny tiefling. So I went along with Liana's pleas to cleanse Zana, and no, turns out Liana means straight up murdering her. Murder. She doesn't care that Zana has helped you so far, or even brought you back to life. By the design of the game, she cannot be reasoned with. Also, the choice you make here determines Sarah's love interest. So if you like both characters, even platonically, you're fucked, son. And this is why Liana is secretly evil, and why Zana is actually good. I know she's a demonic succubus, but Zana is not an evil character. She helps you throughout the game, and not just to further the agenda of Fenrig and your father. Zana actually seems to care whether you live or die. And as the game progresses, she starts to hint at the idea that maybe you don't need your father or Fenrig at all. Maybe you can just take the Skull of Shadows and rule your way. As in, rule the entire world from a seat of absolute power with her as queen. Now she never stipulates that that has to be an evil reign either. All Zana makes very sure you understand is that she would be by your side. Zana is ambitious. Ambitious to the point where she's willing to defy Hell Daddy, leader of the entire demon race, I checked, so that she may rise above her place in the pecking order. To be honest, I don't blame her after hearing the way she's talked about. As you see Yikes, Dad, we talked about this. Can't say that shit anymore. This is why you ended up on the inside. Meanwhile, Little Miss Princess over here will flip her shit if you spare Zana. You've betrayed me! You've betrayed all of us! She'll turn and attack you outright, after saving her life twice. Isn't that just a little bit extreme? Dare I say zealous? So yeah, Liana, like everyone else in this game, is secretly evil. Let's just add that to the pros and cons list. All jokes aside, they really pigeonhole you into picking a love interest. You can't even choose not to pick one. Fun fact, in the two evil outcomes, you basically condemn Zana to an enslaved existence or Liana to endless torture. Wow. And when I played the game sparing Zana, I didn't exactly feel good killing Liana. But at least I was killing in self-defense. Zana fucking loved that shit though. Yes! I've been hoping that you'd do that for a very long time. I guess I respect the game for creating a character that couldn't be reasoned with or talked down. Real life doesn't always work that way. But it always bothered me. Of course, veterans will know that there is a third choice about who to save for the true pro gamer challenge. And that is to try and save Duncan. Duncan. This one is quite a survivor. No. Duncan! No! Duncan! No! Duncan! Oh, Duncan! Ah, oh, well, he was quite a survivor. It's fucking impossible. I tried for an hour, and I am sure I did this back in the day on easy, but on hard, yeah, Dunk ain't coming with us. Let's move quickly towards sound and music. It's a true 50-50, this one. There aren't very many musical tracks throughout the entire game, and to be honest, none that are particularly memorable. The game lacks any sort of main theme, which is absolutely essential in my books. There's some great textbook fantasy music that plays during certain events, particularly during the Stonehelm Siege, with an impressive weight to it. So weighty that I had to turn my music right down just to hear people fucking speak. There are no real standout moments. Its score is functional and gets the job done with a couple of notable exceptions. But that's not to say it's rubbish. It just isn't the most memorable musical score I've heard. Sound design is great though, and easily transports you into the world of the sounds of walking along the cliffside shantytown, my favourite. In fact, this entire segment is one of the most memorable moments in gaming for me. Truly great level, and sound design. You can taste the salt in the air. Active sounds are just as good, with the swordplay sounding absolutely fantastic. The clashes and clangs of steel, the grating as two blades meet, the way they cut through the air, truly love it. 
Unfortunately, the sound balancing is fucking atrocious. Some sounds are so loud that they stop you hearing anything else whatsoever. Every time something happens or someone starts talking, I have to stop moving if I'm walking on sand. Sand is the loudest surface in the game. Think about that for, for two seconds. Creaky floorboards, ancient stone slabs, splashing through water, all stealthier than walking on sand. A floor that literally moves out of the way for you. It's an absolute shame because the sounds are really good for the most part, especially the dialogue. The enemies love to hang out and talk before you kill them. Three bells left on our watch. Quit your bitching. It's an easy enough duty. If I didn't bitch, how would you know it was me? I hope this little method of storytelling and world building never dies. It serves to flesh out the world, maybe give us information about characters and the level that we otherwise wouldn't know. It also makes them more than just faceless automatons to be mowed down. Dark Messiah's enemies have a fair bit to say and it's all worth listening to. Just be sure you're not creeping around on sand at the time or she won't hear shit. Come to beach today! Humans on boat! Tuskles on. I think graphics are a boring thing to judge a game on, so I'm doing visuals and spectacle. And that's how dazzling and interesting it is to me within the style of the game. And Dark Messiah gets a 10, just like JC Denton. For 2006, it's no surprise that the Source engine was the perfect choice to both house a physics-based death derby and render the world of Ashan beautifully. I've already given away that I like the visual style of simpler, harsher edges present in Deus Ex and Half-Life 2. And if I'm being harsh, Crisis would release one year later, absolutely melting any machines it touched. But it wasn't out yet, and with the tools they had to hand, Dark Messiah achieved a great visual fidelity with textures of good quality that synergized perfectly with the dark, moody lighting to create a world that moved you from the bright streets of Stonehelm to the bowels of the necropolis, where only the glow of ancient architecture and strange fungi will light your path. There are tiny little details in the level design that show the designer's care and attention. Trickling water in the sewers, the cave paintings that tell a story we'll never know, along with countless scribblings in eldritch languages. A cliff house that falls if there's too much weight at one side. The detailed mechanisms behind some of the doors and elevators that make moving from one area to another a joy. I particularly love the fact that the evil necromancer underground lair has little signs up to help you find your way around. It also has legions of bunk beds for its denizens. It makes the place feel more real and alive, and the corridors to that place have always been unforgettable for me. But again, nothing compares to the cliffside environments. They are as pleasing visually as they are audibly, and there's a reason they are forever etched into my memory. The areas are designed with enough room for you to move around, but not so much that the threat of falling to your death is ever forgotten. The magic effects are good for the time, if showing their age a little now. The lighting errs a little too much on the dark side for me, and I hate that you regularly have to use dark vision. The game is so pretty and well textured that I would have preferred greater ambient lighting compared to moody realism. When everything is so fucking dark, it's no wonder these guys trip up all the time. Dark vision makes everything white and blue, and it's great in short bursts, but you can end up relying on it way too much. But when the lighting does work, it creates these wonderfully stark scenes with abyssal shadows and otherworldly lights. Environments where you need to be on your toes because you don't know what's lurking in the dark. The characters are well designed for the era, and while I would have liked a bigger variety of enemies, they're all well done. The enemy animations quickly expand past the bog standard bloat with a sword and into charging black knights, mystical sorcerers and crawling reanimated husks, all with believable and different movement patterns that perfectly fit the look of the enemy. Facial animations are of course on par with Half-Life 2. The cutscenes are okay, but they are very few, and for the most part a true cutscene will be an FMV, with that hallmark FMV quality which is unavoidable. It is a great looking game, with beautiful visuals that brings up memories from that era of gaming. It's undeniable that it's aged, but it's aged really well, with only a few scuffs on the bottle. I'll summarise now, starting with the negatives, because I want to end on a positive note. I suffered some crashing problems and consistent FPS stuttering that's not present in the video but a lot of my crashes were solved by using the large address aware tool on it. I recommend doing that. The FPS can get bad enough that new players would be put off. At times the combat can feel like there isn't enough room or enemies to flex your muscles over. Other times it can feel particularly gruelling. You can get absolutely smashed in one room over and over. 
only to go through the next room feeling like you cheated your way through. The boss fights are also really disappointing. The only really satisfying one being the Orc Chieftain, because it's a sword fight, and not that easy. Also, fuck ghouls, honestly, they're shit, and they just don't feel like they fit into the game. The problem I talked about in the story can really cut deep if you care about that sort of thing. I do care about it, that's why I ranted for so long. I've said it's a more action oriented game, and that's fine. Take away the RPG combat elements, but don't tease with half measures when it comes to dialogue. I feel like there is a lot more to say in this game that goes unsaid, and the choice to spare Zana does a disservice to Liana's character in having her attack you. Killing you would mean Arantir lays waste to Stonehelm, it just makes no sense. Burnage. But put these things aside and look at the game for what it is. A fun, beautiful sandbox with plenty of enemies to fight in as many ways as you can invent. The story is a loose framework to move you from level to level, fighting and progressing. I don't know why people said it was too easy. Would I recommend Dark Messiah of Might and Magic? Yeah, absolutely. It's an absolute hall of famer for me that fell between the cracks with its exciting combat, stark visuals, and of course, omnipresent Succubus who closes the loop with her charm. Arcane Studios did a great job. I was fortunate enough to play Dishonored when it came out, and it was clear to see where the bones had come from. And I've no doubt if we look closer we'll see the fossils of Arx Fatalis in there somewhere. I haven't played that, so maybe I'll tackle that someday. And Dishonored was pretty fucking great. The power system feels like a less restrictive version of Dark Messiah's skill tree. Arcane Studios were also behind the cancelled game The Crossing, that would have been an interesting swordplay meets tactical firepower universe jumping game, with everyone's favourite boys, the Knights Templar. Only in that game, players could assume the role of NPCs. They had some pretty cool ideas. They're doing vampires now, which is kind of cool I guess, we'll see. But for me, I'll always remember them for this game. As good as Dishonored was, Dark Messiah struck a chord with me that seared it into my memory. Maybe it's just the time it came out and the age I played it at, but there's something very special about this game to me, and I like to think that whatever world Saraf and Zana went on to create, it was a good one. Oh, well. There you go. This isn't working.